Were you finger flubbing Mary Jane Rotten Pants in her pretty pink undies? Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons. And alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Tuboku Hartman. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. Each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we will provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we view TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing this fine morning? So, Gene, today we are going to go back to a place we visited a few weeks ago with Jacob's Ladder. We're going to go back to the Mekon Valley and uh, do something very familiar, the Vietnam War, for one of our listeners, Steve, who wanted us to do the 1987 war drama Stanley Kubrick classic, Full Metal Jacket. Hey, Shet Crew, it's Hot Sauce Steve calling in for my commission of... Shit, I forgot that. Full Metal Jacket. There we go. <laughs> Jesus. Um, so I only remember bits and pieces of this jacket. Jack, God, I can't talk. I'm not drunk, I swear. I just woke up a little bit ago, and I know I needed to get a hold of you guys about my email for it. So let's start over. Um, I don't really remember too much about this movie. I've seen bits and pieces. I know I've watched it once or twice. <clears throat> and I remember, like, Vincent Scenario going crazy and other stuff like that. But... I don't really remember how it holds up. Um, my dad, like Ash's, was in Vietnam. He was a gunner and a helicopter. Unlike Ash's dad, though, my dad loves war movies. So when a movie was on TV, I could watch it with him as a kid growing up. I couldn't watch, like, the rated R versions, but I could watch the TV versions. So I know I've watched this once or twice, but it's been a while. So hopefully it holds up okay, and you guys have a great day. Bye. I just want to point out, Steve, my dad loves war movies. He just doesn't like Vietnam war movies because he was in Vietnam. Those are the only ones he doesn't particularly care for. Tropic Thunder, again, being the worst of them. Uh, I want to know what the hell the TV version of this sounds like. Were you (laughs) finger flubbing Mary Jane rotten pants in her pretty pink undies? Like, what the hell does a TV version sound like? It's lame. That's what it is. Well, Full Metal Jacket is a 1987 war drama directed and produced by Stanley Kubrick. The film is based on the 1979 novel The Short Timers and stars Matthew Modine, Arlie Ermey, Vincent D'Onofrio, and Adam Baldwin. The storyline follows a platoon of U.S. Marines through their boot camp training, then explores the experiences of Marines during the Tet Offensive. Warner Brothers released Full Metal Jacket in the United States on June 26, 1987. The film received critical acclaim grossed $120 million against a budget of $16 million and was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. In 2001, the American Film Institute placed the film at number 95 in its poll titled AFI's 100 Years, 100 Thrills. It's Big D, Ash, we heard about Steve's experiences with this movie. What are your memories of Full Metal Jacket? And I know I've said this before, but there are certain movies that you don't remember a time before it. I couldn't tell you the first time I saw this. You know, I know I was a fan of war movies at the time, but I think I like more gung ho Rambo type stuff. But it just it seems like Sergeant Hartman was always in my mind. And when I went to basic training, he was there. He went through it with me. I felt like that was a preview of a lot of what I what I experienced. But this movie, I mean, it's it's one of those classics 
that I think even people who don't like war films or military films, they'll know and respect even if they don't love it. Yeah, I went through a major Stanley Kubrick phase, which I'm sure is not surprising for absolutely anyone that is out there listening. But at that time, obviously, at some point, Full Metal Jacket came into the picture because I digested like literally everything he had ever done. And I've always loved the opening of this movie. I like the the whole juxtaposition of like the vignette of them being shaved at the start and then how it progresses throughout the movie. And I think Kubrick is amazing. And so therefore I think this movie is amazing. And when you add to all of that, the way that this movie is shot, because I think it is shot really beautifully, it's a favorite war film of mine. And I hope we get into some of it tonight, but you know, the masses, if that's what we want to call them. There's the big argument between this and Apocalypse Now as, you know, which one is the best war movie of all time. And I'm really hoping that somebody out there will allow us like generously to commission and then us do Apocalypse Now, because I think we're going to have a good conversation about this one. But it's going to be interesting if we get to do that one kind of alongside it, because they're very different. I forgot how different they are, but they're both really fantastic movies. When it comes to samples in industrial music, I think Full Metal Jacket and like Blade Runner are the most sampled movies in the world. And I was nine years old when I first heard Ministry's album, The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste, and it heavily samples Full Metal Jacket. And so I would be singing along to these songs, and there were these drops in the samples where you hear lines like, you will not kill. And I was like, what the fuck is that from? And of course, there's no Google. You can't just be like, where's that from? So I took the liner notes from The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste, and I asked around, and finally I discovered this film. And at nine years old, I had already decided that I wanted a military career. And so seeing Full Metal Jacket felt like the most profound film I'd ever seen in my life. After that, my friends and I regularly watched this like after school. And it was one of the few movies I owned on VHS. I still remember that cover art, that box, and it was just a joy to watch over and over and over again. And I think as I've grown up, the movie's kind of grown with me. I've understood different aspects of it, but it's a movie I hate to say this, that even a nine-year-old can enjoy. (laughs) Let's hit the trailer. Paris Island, South Carolina, the United States Marine Corps Recruit Depot, an eight-week college for the phony tough and the crazy brave. That is not your daddy's shotgun, cowboy. Private Joker is silly and he's ignorant. But he's got guts, and guts is enough. Most of you will go to Vietnam. Some of you will not come back. Cowboy. Sir, yes, sir. 0300, infantry. Joker. Sir, yes, sir. 4212, basic military journalism. You think you're Mickey Spillane? Sir, I wrote for my high school newspaper, sir. I hate the name, Joker. I want to go into the field. You wasted your first day in the field, and it'd be my fault. Joker, you will take off that button. How's it gonna look if you get killed wearing a peace symbol? What is that you've got written on your helmet? Born to kill, sir. You write born to kill on your helmet, and you wear a peace button. Would you love your country? Yes, sir. Why don't you jump on the team and come on in for the big win? I'm squad leader. Falling anywhere, scumbag. I need help. I'm trying to help you, Leonard. We're not leaving Doc J and A ball out there. Are those live rounds? Seven, six, two millimeter. Full metal jacket. A group of recruits, including J.T. Davis, nicknamed Joker, arrives in Paris Island to become Marines. The overweight and clumsy Leonard Lawrence, nicknamed Private Pyle, begins to irk drill instructor Gunnery Sergeant Hartman and the rest of his platoon with his constant errors and mistakes. Things come to a head when Hartman discovers a jelly donut considered contraband in the barracks. Fed up, Hartman imposes collective punishment on the entire platoon except Lawrence by ordering them to exercise every time Lawrence makes a mistake. 
So I promise not to fangirl out all over Stanley Kubrick this entire episode, but it is hard because I do think he's really incredible. And I think the opening of this movie is a perfect example of that. So you've got your setup here, you know, you're, we're with these Marines and they all look so different. Like their hair coming in are absolutely different. They all kind of are indicative of their personalities and then they get their heads shaved. And the more and more we see their heads shaved, if you watch it and Kubrick did this intentionally, like it gets more aggressive, like each person that's getting their head shaved where at the start, it's like, Oh, we're at a barber and we're getting a nice little shern, you know, head here. And then at the end, it's like, like, you know, it's like a lawnmower over the top of them. And so it's meant to feel like more disturbing, the more and more we see them and it's aggressive, it's defeating. And it's the moment where like, they all begin to look alike and Kubrick intended it for them to show that they're losing all individuality. And I think that the sequence has always made me really uncomfortable. One, because I have this thing about heads being shaved and like teeth being pulled out. It's this recurring nightmare I have. And so I'm sure there's something there for me that, you know, it's psych- like in my own psyche is broken. But besides my own fears, I think that I'm feeling this whole idea of like, here they are, they're being stripped, they're being made new, and they're going to be crafted in the image of the core, right? And then there's that great scene where they look on the floor, and it's like, all the hairs on the floor, like dead bodies, like a lot of them will eventually become, and then it just gets swept away. The life they have before is gone, their life in the core is here now, and the core owns them, and they'll live and die for it for the foreseeable future. That is such a spectrum, Ash, from getting your head shaved to getting your teeth pulled out. <laughs> it's a thing, man. It's like they in my nightmare, they they tie me to a chair, they shave my head, but only half of it. And it's over my right ear because I have disturbingly small ears. Like they're very strangely small. And my right ear is smaller than my left ear. So I've always been self-conscious of it. And so they shave just the right head so my ear shows. And then they come and they pull my two incisors so I can never be a vampire. I'm I'm telling you, I've had this nightmare since I was 15 years old. I have it at least three or four times a year. As I talked about watching it as a nine-year-old or watching as an adult, Ash is seeing all this symbolism (laughs) like in the haircut scene. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. They're getting haircuts. It's funny. (laughs) Their heads are bold. (laughs) This scene like sets the playbook for future movies depiction of boot camp, right? Like you see everybody do this in the army now, Jarhead, whether it's a drama or a comedy. Mm. I didn't think it was disturbing. I thought this whole first part of the movie was just funny. I thought it was just a funny scene, but, but I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. Like I guarantee this, you're right. And this was Kubrick's intent, but I hadn't moved into philosophical mode at this point in the movie. I just thought it was a funny <laughs> scene. Yeah, but you're right. Other movies do boot camp, but none have been like this. Normally we meet somebody like in the army. Now we meet the slackers. They go to boot camp. We're prepping for it. We see the before this movie has two distinct halves. First half is boot camp, then war. It starts out and you're just thrown right into it. You are a recruit. You're there. You're sitting, getting your your head shaved. And you right away meet Sergeant Hartman. And it's famously played by R. Lee Ermey. He's going to take us through that introduction, the indoctrination that we're maggots. We're worth nothing. And he was originally hired to be nothing more than a technical advisor on the film. He was there to make sure everything was authentic. And they had hired another actor, Tim Colcheri, to play Hartman. They tested him out and said, hey, go out and insult the group of extras they had. And after 30 minutes, he couldn't come up with anything new. So Ermi stepped in and he went on for an hour plus. He eventually ended up writing 150 pages worth of insults that were all his and he's gold. He makes the movie something special. But they didn't just, you know, cast Cole Cherry aside. They moved him to the role of the the gunner that we see as they're riding the the Huey and the how do you kill women and children and the famous line, easy, you just don't lead them so much. But without Ermy, I don't think this movie is as memorable as it is because you can't fake that realism of an actual drill sergeant. He gives the movie authenticity and immediately we're shocked into the the mindset of a recruit at Paris Island. 
that's the thing about this sequence of the movie is it's hilarious. Like you can't help but laugh at his insults. He's so fucking funny. And throughout the movie, he keeps that up. Like when he makes them all sing happy birthday to Jesus, like it's just this absurdity <laughs> to his character and to his role. And I think this is one of the things that like Stanley Kubrick fans love is this dark humor because it reminds me of like the really disturbing, but you can't help but laugh, you know, impromptu version of singing in the rain and a clockwork orange to the here's Johnny line and the way it's delivered and the shining like Kubrick knows how to like kind of combine and mesh into like this weird amalgam of like drama and horror and humor and this is the perfect example of that because I laughed more I know we're going to do nuns on the run next week I laughed more in this movie at the drill sergeant than I did in the entirety of that film and the entirety of a lot of our films because he's fucking awesome they're going to put that on the artwork on the cover of Full Metal Jacket. You'll laugh more than nuns on the run. <laughs> You're welcome. I remember as a kid watching this movie and thinking that Arlie Ermy, I was like, why are they afraid of this old man? There's just an old man yelling at them. Why are they afraid of him? I saw it this week. I'm like, shit, he looks he looks pretty good. Like, he's only 43 <laughs> in this movie. He is not an old man. Fuck we are so old. But Big D, I agree with you. His bearing, his appearance, you cannot achieve that without being the real deal. I mean, you watch his body movement, how stiff his arms are, how perfectly, perfectly aligned his uniform is. There, There is no actor. And I've seen Jarhead. Mm -mm. It's not even close. It's night and fucking day. No. So I, I experienced a real life version of Sergeant Hartman. Uh, when I was in, I went to the Sapper Leader course. And at that point, you're elite enough you're capable you're physically fit you're the upper level of combat engineers and, and infantry so when you go you're expected to be able to outrun outperform out knowledge everybody right so we get there and there was this e7 i cannot remember his name but he looks like hartman skinny wiry old surly this dude would take us running in the morning with a cigarette and a cup of coffee. <laughs> and he would smoke the living dog shit out of us. We would be running and dying. And he's like, come on, ladies. And he's smoking. <laughs> and it, it just brought even more out of us, out of respect for this dude who could just humiliate us. And I mean, at that point, I was running you know, a sub 12 minute, two mile. You know, so we were fast enough. And this dude was making us look like nothing. Hartman brought all those memories flooding back. For those people who aren't runners or don't run as a normal part of PT, for fight camp, we're required to do a 12-minute mile and a half. So Big D at his size yes. doing sub-12 minutes <laughs> on a two-mile, that's fucking insane. Sergeant Hartman, I mean, we mentioned he's clearly the biggest entertainment factor in this movie. And we've talked about other drill instructors we've seen in other films and the lack of authenticity there. Not only... Is Arlie Ermey's performance impressive and genuine? Sergeant Hartman himself, as Ash mentioned with Kubrick movies, there is a distinct philosophy there. There is another layer going on. And he introduces himself in that opening scene as hard but fair. And I'm not a fan of hazing. I will move away from any group or institution that employs hazing as a tactic, whether it's a motorcycle club, whether it's a fight club, like whether it's a soccer <laughs> supporter group. If there is hazing, like just unnecessary cruelty to people, I'm out. I don't believe it makes people grow closer together. I don't believe it's good psychologically. But I think Hartman overall is pretty fair. Is he right for today's military? Probably not. I have friends who are in the Air Force, who are in the Marine Corps, who have jobs that have nothing to do with combat, have nothing to do with infantry. They don't necessarily need that, right? They're computer dorks. They're surveillance guys, right? But this was the Marine Corps during Vietnam. They were training Marines. As you heard, everybody got that dis that designation, 0300, right? Infantry. That's where these guys are going. And I think for them, he's the right guy. It's not preschool. He's training men who will most likely see combat. You got to remember, he's preparing them for a living hell. And it's hard to think of like in a civilian mentality, like, oh, that's mean. That's harsh. I had a good friend who was fired from the fire department because the recruit said he was too hard on them. And he said, you know what? I'm training them for a job. I'm training them to survive. You wouldn't train a scuba diver and say, we're not putting you in the water. You're training these guys for an environment where they're going to depend on their friend. They're going to need to know that when everything is chaotic, everything's falling apart, 
and your brain is pushed to its breaking point, or what are you going to do? Are you going to survive? Can people trust you? And I think tough love, it often is needed in life. And I think in this specifically, it's a requirement of the job or you're setting them up to be killed. There's a scene in Full Metal Jacket where Hartman, you know, forces Pyle to choke himself with Hartman's hand, right? He has him bring his neck forward and put it in there. You know, when you're watching it, when you're younger, you're like, God, what a fucking asshole. Like, that's just cruel. That's unnecessary. That's so sadistic, right? As an adult, I'm watching him like, this motherfucker won't stop smiling. He doesn't understand the severity of the situation he's in. And I've been in those situations where you can't stop laughing because there's nothing to change that attitude. There's nothing to change that behavior. And getting choked will make you stop laughing. <laughs> it's effective. But I got to question though, is the homophobia necessary? Is the racism necessary? Is the punishing everybody necessary? The resounding answer to that from the civilian on the podcast is no. Um, It's not necessary at all. And so as a civilian watching this movie, this movie disturbs the fucking hell out of me. And I already talked about the beginning with my hair shaving phobia. And now we've got the rifle creed, which is probably the most famous thing from this movie. If you've not seen it before, he makes them all get into bed and basically pray to their rifles um you know give themselves over to them and so they're laying there with their guns and they say what they're saying and every time they do it gives me chills every time i watch this movie because you've got the beginning so their hair is like being swept away alongside the world views because they're not able to have any world views like i have while they're in this situation they're in the core and their god is war And the sacraments of their God are blood and the rifles used to bring that blood about, right? Yep. So you've got the full transition to their new image here. They're no longer human. They've begun this journey to not being a normal person. They're becoming, as the drill sergeant says over and over again, killers. And there's this whole religious allegorical piece that runs through the entirety of this film. And I got to tell you, this is a religion I want fucking nothing to do with. You're not wrong. All of that's accurate, but it's also just fucking cool. (laughs) Pre-internet, I don't know if you guys remember, you could only get like posters from like three places. You go to the record store, you could go to the concert, or in Arizona, we had a place called Shirts and Things. And Hot Topic. Shirts and Things slash Hot Topic. It's it's uh, it's basically the same thing, right? It's like you go there, they got t-shirts, they got posters, they got Zippo lighters. You know, it's it's basically Hot Topic, but locally grown. Yeah. I remember I walked into Shirts and Things. It was hot as shit outside. It was July in Arizona. And they had those. Do you remember it was like the flippy rack with the posters? Yeah. And you like go through and like browse click, them. Click, click, yeah. And I click it and boom. There's this Rifleman's Creed poster. I was like, fuck, yes. Spent my hard-earned money on it, bought it, took it home, put it over my childhood bed. When I went to college, I took it with me. I put it over my bed in the dorms. Oh, man, this thing is just fucking cool. Chilling? No. Awesome? Yeah. See, but I think that's the thing, though, is I I think that Kubrick would have loved the irony of that. He would love the irony that you're putting something above your bed that he thinks is like fucking disgusting and disturbing. I would have never fucked a dude that had the rifle create above their bed. Just saying. See, but I want to address two things that were said. First, Gene talking about the group punishment and and the things that they said. Remember the time frame the movie was in and the military uses a technique No matter what you do, you're going to be wrong. The purpose is to build a cohesion. You want to punish everyone because you're getting them physically fit. You're putting them through an experience that builds a bond that hopefully will survive when they're in combat. So it serves a purpose what they're trying to do. And Ash talked about religion, and she doesn't want to be part of this religion. Religion's important in the military because you got to believe you're putting people in to die, that there is something after. So I went in as an atheist. And I have on my dog tags, Buddhist, just because I thought it was kind of funny. Oh, my God. And, and, and on Sundays, you have an option to go to religious services. And religion is key because you have to believe this isn't it. Otherwise, you can't go into combat. Sorry, Buddhists. <laughs> Clearly, um, the team building that they're going for here with the beating people with soaps and slapping people in the face and calling them awful homophobic slurs like it really worked out in the end for both the drill sergeant and um, one of the particular soldiers. So. Good job. It, well, we'll disagree on whether or not it worked, but it's ironic that you could be in a room full of, let's say, the highest level military, and they could be talking, fuck this, fuck that, we're going to kill this, we're going to do that. If you say GD, the room will come to a stop. There is an utmost respect for religion, 
because a lot of times it's all you have to push through for the mission. So I understand his presence. One evening, members of the platoon take revenge on Lawrence by beating him with soap bars. Eventually, Lawrence appears to turn himself around. Joker, however, notices Lawrence talking to his rifle and surmises he may have suffered a mental breakdown. Nevertheless, the recruits <laughs> graduate. Most of them will be sent to Vietnam. On their final night on Paris Island, Joker discovers Lawrence in the bathroom, loudly reciting the Rifleman's Creed and brandishing a loaded rifle. Hartman attempts to intervene, but he is shot and killed by Lawrence, who then commits suicide. So beyond the performance of Ermi as Sergeant Hartman, the, the other part of this movie that people remember is Vincent D'Onofrio's performance and his transformation. When he started on this movie, he was a good-looking, trim, athletic actor, 6'3", great shape. To get the role of, of Pyle, he decided to put on weight and he actually put on nearly 70 pounds. He changed his body. It, it had a shocking effect. It helped him get the role. And this is the most weight gained by an actor for a role. It surpassed Robert De Niro when he did 60 pounds for Raging Bull. He was so out of shape that when they were filming the obstacle course, he actually blew out his left knee and needed surgery. His immediate film after this, if you remember our adventures in babysitting, was as Thor, the uh, tow truck station's owner. He transformed his body to get the role, and he became probably one of the most memorable parts of any Vietnam film, and that performance was based on his physical transformation. He also transforms on screen, like as we're watching him. In the beginning, you look at Pyle, he's this smiling, chubby, like adorable guy. And you want to just rescue him from the Marine Corps. You want to bust in that room and be like, what the fuck are you doing here? Let's go, buddy. By the end, he looks like a drooling monster. Like Vincent D isn't in the movie for very long. He's only in for a few minutes, but he's every bit as impressive as Matthew Modine and Arliss Howard, who get way more screen time. Yeah, you know, D'Onofrio would eventually play one of my favorite bad guy roles in that weird ass movie with Jennifer Lopez, The Cell. And it's like you see that character here. And if you want to stick with the religious thing, he looks completely possessed, right? The rifle possessed him. Didn't work <laughs> out, Big D. No, but th that shit, that almost gave me a nightmare. I was watching this late at night. And when when he's on fire guard and you hear the the, the noise in the bathroom and he walks in and he's just sitting there. I was like, holy shit, his lip is quivering. He's breathing like, hey, Joker. And he's got his like brow furrowed. He is transformed into the thing of nightmares. I was kind of pissed at Joker, though. I remember him walking in and like the rifle was already loaded. Dude is putting bullets oh, in agreed. the magazine. You got to stick, agreed. beat him in the fucking head. What do you think is going to happen here? I, I agree. That was his best option. Charge him, make a move, get the weapon away from him, scream help. He could, maybe he wasn't expecting him to go through with it, but yeah, missed opportunity. So by this point in the movie, Full Metal Jacket is trucking along. I'm completely in its grasp. It's got me. I fully understand everything that's happening to the characters, everything that's going on with boot camp. I don't need any help from a narrator. Unlike other movies we've seen where we're like, what the fuck is going on? Then, for some reason, at the 38-minute mark, Kubrick decides, you know what we need? Some narration. Suddenly, Joker feels the need to start talking directly to the audience. If it gave us some insight if it helped us understand better what was going on, if it gave us some more views into Joker as a character, fine, have at it. But this didn't give us any insight, and it felt like a cheap way to try to get cerebral. Like, they wanted to sound smart, so they throw in some voiceovers by Matthew Modine. Oh, no, I think they needed to do it because of the form of the movie. The novel is a series of vignettes. The movie basically is that. Right around this point, Gene, where he starts narrating is where we're getting ready to transition into the second half. There he narrates throughout. So without the narration beginning in boot camp, I think it would be really jarring to have him just start all of a sudden. Now we're in theater and now I'm going to start talking to the audience. But do you think they need a narration at all during any point in this? No, not at all. No, I thought they were trying to handhold some when it the, the, without it, it showed more respect and restraint. I don't think so. But I want to go back to here just to address the, the, the code red situation that we've kind of danced around. So Pyle's been fucking up. Sergeant Hartman has tried everything. It's not working. And then he gets caught with a jelly donut. This isn't a case of where he wasn't doing something well. He was out of shape. He fell out of runs. He couldn't do the obstacle course. He is hiding a jelly donut in his footlocker. He gets caught. 
the platoon at this point has nothing else they can do. They need to take it into their own hands. And, and Hartman steers them that way. So they hold him down. They get the, the soap and the towel, which hopefully will eliminate the bruising on the surface. And you say, yeah, it's cruel. It's terrible. They shouldn't do this. But on the surface, it works. Pyle becomes a better Marine. He's more focused. Yes, he's screwed up in the head. They find his talent to shoot. He's actually able to follow direction. If the goal is to create a killing machine, to create a soldier to go into combat, this works out in the end. Yes, he shoots Hartman. But other than that, it worked. I am so glad that my video camera is not working today so you guys can't see me because the eye roll that I just gave was so big it might have shaken your screen. It worked out in the end. Are you fucking kidding me? It was mission this, accomplished. This is what I think is so scary is that military people who I respect, guys, I come from a super military family, that they view this movie as cool. Like, I think this movie is a fucking warning. And I think what you're seeing here is, Gene, you called it hazing. I know this is a really loaded word today, but it's outright bullying is what it is. And (laughs) it shows what the bullying is and how the bullying happens and what it does to them. It's like that show 13 Reasons Why, where the girl slits her wrist at the end. Like, bullying has extreme consequences because it can break somebody's psyche. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing for the good of the core for the good America, like we're going to break these people down and treat them as less than human. That can't be the only way to make a good soldier because like my dad was a great soldier. And like he said, he didn't have drill instructors like this. No, not everybody is drilled like this. You don't raise every kid the same way. Not everyone in the platoon. Snowball needs to be trained different than Joker, than Pyle. So I'm not saying everybody needs this. And it becomes the drill sergeant's job is to parent and to shape everyone. And it's not bullying. Ideally, you would have wanted to get Pyle out of the military. The ideal would be to not send him over, because if you send him in his non-bullied, if you walk him through and he gets through, he's going to end up having five or six other people get killed and himself. Kick him out. Don't make him kill people. I agree. And the Section 8, we would have people. We're an all-volunteer army now. I would have people try to Section 8 to get out. I went to basic training with this kid who was like, I, I think he got caught on meth. And the judge said, either enlist or go to jail. So we had this fuck up who was much like Pyle. And weeks into basic training, the drill sergeant kind of gave us the wink like, hey, you guys need to take care of this. Now, we we had a long discussion as a platoon. What do we do? And we decided not to do it. And thankfully, this kid left of his own free will or whatever it was. It's It seems harsh. It seems terrible. But it's what saves lives. Okay, what this movie is showing is like psyches break in different ways, right? And I think that I agree with you in the sense that it's showing that in order to become a killing machine, you have to go a little crazy to be a good soldier, to be a killer and have a job that kills, you have to be disconnected from the human experience. And it affects them even if they've been prepped. Like my dad tells a story about Vietnam where his very best friend, his name was Goble, he and Goble were on a a cleanup because a they had set off a landmine or something like that and it had blown up a bus in a local village. And so their entire little group had to go down there to help clean up. They were picking up bodies and moving them and they picked up this little girl. My dad said she probably was four or five. She was dead. She's face down. They picked her up and like all of her insides just like fell out onto the ground. And he said, and it was awful. He said, but they saw a lot worse stuff than that, right? Like there were other things they had seen that was worse than this, but like Goebel's mind like totally broke. And that night, cause it was monsoon season that night, like he had to go out there and it took 16 of them to get him off the roof of one of the places on their base because he was standing there and he had his dick in one hand because he was naked and his gun in the other. And he was screaming, this is my rifle. This is my gun. This one's for shooting. This one's for fun. And then like firing off his gun everywhere because he was fucking wasted and they had to get him down. And eventually he got sent home because like he was like completely broken yeah. after what happened. And my dad said for him, it was when he shot a dude and the guy took another three steps forward toward him and he's like i knew he was dead and he knew he was dead but he was still coming toward me trying to kill me and like my dad is 71 years old and still has nightmares about that weekly right so like your psyche breaks in different ways in war because you're not meant to be in an environment like that no and i think this movie shows us like how they're prepping them for that but i think it's also warning us that that's a problem because then these people don't come home human 
Yeah, I think to reconcile all those ideas, like Kubrick's message there is that the military has developed this process, right? And the process works for the most part. Now, Big D, I don't agree with you. Hey, they built a really fast car. It doesn't have brakes, but holy shit, is it fast, right? <laughs> I, I think there's a process. It works. There's a price. Some people, it, it helps them become Marines and survive war. And some people, it completely breaks them psychologically, right? And the importance is to find those section aids and get the fuck out of there. What struck me during this Code Red situation is the way everyone moved and the way the music was moved. It's it's the first time in the film that we get that ominous, like stalking music, that hunting music that we hear later in in Vietnam. If you notice the entire platoon inside the barracks, they're moving, they're 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 moving like quietly, stealthily, right before they come up and they beat pile. And I, I can't figure out like if Kubrick is suggesting that this is the beginnings of their ability to be killers, to be different. Like if if this is a change in the platoon over before, or what are you suggesting? But remember, Joker's the main character. Joker's the one telling us the story. Yeah. I think it's the transformation of Joker. Joker went from the loving, sympathetic, joking guy who's gonna, you know, nurture and take care of Pyle to he stands there and hits him and hits him and hits him. And hits him. And it almost that moment of watching Joker go from a friend who was trusted. I think that's the transition mostly. And I think this is the same thing we saw like in Of Mice and Men, right? Where it's you, you've got a guy who's entrusted with the care of another person who's struggling and you do harbor a resentment. Deep down, you have a resentment. You need to get that out. Joker isn't a mean person. No. He doesn't want to see Pyle in pain, but he's carrying so much frustration of the weight that Pyle puts on him. That he's got to exercise that some way, and he does it just by beating the shit out of him, which, by the way, I always thought Pyle was blindfolded doing this. He's looking right at him while he's doing it, and that's that's the scariest part. I think that we've got to talk about what happens with Pyle because it's one of the the more famous and you know moving moments of this movie. And you know, I think that he's supposed to be maybe the everyman is the wrong word, but he's supposed to be like your typical civilian, like your kid that's like recruited in by draft who wasn't somebody that's a military person. And so he gets in there and he's what a lot of civilians would be in these circumstances. We talked about the grinning. Like I would look at these people and have a shit eating grin on my face. Be like, fuck you, right? Like, I I'm not military. I'm not there to be yelled at. And I think that he's beaten in this movie. And then that moment, like it continues with that religious metaphor. Like he, what's the the quote? He's born again hard. That's what they want him to be. He's born again hard. So we've got these religious connections continuing. And for me, it is so fucked up because he's born again. But he's born without the empathy that made him human to begin with. And I think that's where, like, the genius of the first part of this movie lies. Because in Pyle's final moments, like, he's the ultimate success of this military machine that you're talking about, Big D, right? Like, he is a soldier, and he is a killer, and he can shoot straight, and he can shoot without remorse. But then he kills himself without remorse, without thinking. And it just happens to be himself. And there's this irony here that's both funny and disturbing, because the military machine creates its ultimate student that results in killing itself, the machine the machine is going to wind up destroying itself in the end, I think is what Kubrick's saying. I think we're being a little kind to pile here though. I don't think he's just suboptimal. I think he's substandard, right? Like I've met some major fuck ups on sports teams in Krav in jujitsu, even in air force junior ROTC. There were some people where I'm like, how the fuck do you manage to feed yourself every day? But I have never <laughs> met a fuck up like Pyle. I, I don't think he's an everyman. And Ash, I, I know you didn't say he was, but he's disabled. Yeah. Like he is a disabled person. You simultaneously feel for him and loathe him for being there. Can't say enough about the casting, the way Kubrick presents yeah. all this and Vincent D's performance. I mean, this is some of the most powerful film we've ever seen. Agreed. By January 1968, Joker is a sergeant and is based in Da Nang for the newspaper Stars and Stripes alongside his colleague, Private First Class Rafterman, a combat photographer. The Tet Offensive begins and Joker's base is attacked, but it holds. The following morning, Joker and Rafterman are sent to Fubai, where Joker coincidentally reunites with Sergeant Cowboy, a friend he met at Paris Island. During the Battle of Wei, a booby trap kills the squad leader, leaving Cowboy in command. Becoming lost in the city, Cowboy tries to raise tank support, but he is killed by a Viet Cong sniper. 
So the opening half of this film is perfect in its simplicity. They don't need to do a whole lot to show us Paris Island. You don't need a soundtrack. You don't need much of a set. Just put these phenomenal actors like Arlie Ermey, Matthew Modine, and Vincent D in a room together and let their voices and bodies do the work. But in the second half of the movie, holy shit, like Kubrick takes us to Vietnam, those city streets, the canals, the destroyed urban centers, all of it looked incredible. And what's amazing, all of that was filmed in England. Yeah, absolutely amazing. They 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 used, I think it was like a dock that they they destroyed, but they imported palm trees. You keep thinking, wouldn't it have been easier to go someplace tropical? But I was completely sold. I, I believed it. When they're sitting there on the street and and they're being propositioned by the prostitute, like you're really there. You're in Southeast Asia. And we get to one of the most memorable memorable parts of this movie. And a lot of times when you're listening to you, you hinted earlier, Gene, about some of the sampling from movies and you're trying to figure out where it is. Sir Mixlot, the big hit baby's got back. They do the miso horny, but then two live crew. A lot of people won't remember this band. This was like the dirty, raunchy, I almost say like the rap group that made things. They were really controversial. They took the full lines and incorporated it into one of the most memorable songs that I had to listen to during during my my note taking, and I'm going to play it for you now. But it brings a smile to my face. I'm watching Arsenio <laughs> Hall took out my black book for a freak to call. So good, but I, I found myself wondering because they're negotiating, and the prostitute promises that she's going to love you for a long time, which I think is a good deal. She's very horny, and the, the price she wants is fifteen <laughs> bucks. Okay, in 1968, I'm like 15 bucks. It's got to be great. So I did some research and the purchasing power of $15 in 1968 today is 124 bucks, roughly. That seems like a fair price for one person performing sex acts for a long time, regardless of how buku they are. Okay, so for those who don't know, long time is a specific type of service versus short time. Short time is I'm just going to get you off. Long time is I'm hanging out with you all night. Like oh. we are hanging out until tomorrow. But Big D, you pay one hundred twenty five dollars for sex in Da Nang. No, no, I was I was thinking it was very steep at first. I was thinking, what a bargain, fifteen bucks. Why are we negotiating? But for for one twenty five, that that is steep. So uh, if it's a full night of you know company, <laughs> then you're getting really the bargain of it being multiple sex acts. So if you break it down per sex act, I think it's a fair deal. Let's go into the hypotheticals here. All right, so you're a single guy. The person who is performing the sex acts is doing it completely consensually of their own volition. It's not human trafficking. They're not being exploited in any way. It is not even a war zone, let's say. You're deployed in, yep. in a city, and this person is just a working professional, just a, just a sex worker. What do you think the value is that you would play? First of all, would you go short time or long time? Oh, long time. Long and time. then if you were to do long time, like what do you, what would you expect to pay for that? Well, I mean, the thing is, my life expectancy at this point really isn't that long. So I'm not thinking about saving money. Mm. So I wouldn't be nitpicking. I would search for quality. I would want, and uh, let's just say, services that were you know up to my standard. I, I would want to find a girl that I thought was very good. This girl, her, her kind of, her rhythm isn't too good. I don't <laughs> think it would be really top level. I want to find somebody with good rhythm. Somebody who's like, yeah, oh yeah, she define would, rhythm. Uh, hers was very herky jerky. Like her stroke? There was a zombie-like quality about her walk. She was shambling a bit. Yeah, yes, I agree. Shambling and shaking out of rhythm. It looked like a, a robot gone wrong. I mean, she was walking in heels among rubble in a leather miniskirt. So, and she probably just got wrecked. So, yeah, but she she should be a professional. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So don't walk funny afterwards. No, if you're gonna do it. Do it to your best. You know, if you're going to be whatever your job is, I would expect a higher level of performance from her. Uh, but she's not selling her skills at all. Ash, how about you? How much would I expect to pay or how much would I charge? Charge. Oh, shit. I don't want to put you in a gendered role here. No, I mean, it's fine. So I'll leave it up to you. If I'm charging, I'm going to prefer long time because I'm going to get more money, right? Mm. And I figure there's a refractory period, so I'm going to get breaks in between. So <laughs> Yeah, these guys are like 19 years old, though. Yeah, there's still a little bit of time. Like, I'll get like, you know, three minutes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think how much would I charge for a night with me? Definitely not 125 What are we thinking? For a night with me, let's go 1200 Whoa, okay. That's actually less than I thought. Unless there's like butt stuff. That's less than you actually earn, right? 
Like in my job? Like if I were to hire you on a contract basis for actual like- Yeah, I make 175 bucks an hour. So you're actually giving me a discount. Right. I mean, but like if you want like special <laughs> stuff, like if I like there's butt stuff or oh. if I got to wear a costume, like there's definitely add-ons. But look, Pretty Woman, it was 4000 for the week. So I think that's kind of set the bar at where it should be. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pretty Woman has set the bar for where where <laughs> sex workers should be paid. That's what did it. I insist on a bubble bath and a trip to Tiffany's. Yeah, some free yep. clothes, four thousand a that. week, and we'll take you to watch Polo. But Gene, you know, as a digital marketer, that cost of acquisition of a new customer mm. that's key to think about. So sure. the love you long time saves time on the street finding new customers. Sure. So in the end, even though you might be making less per act. The overall, what you'll make on an annual basis is probably higher. Oh, and the risk is lower too, of course. Right, because you only have one dick. <laughs> well, hopefully. I mean, you don't know. Your dick risk is lowered. Yeah, you don't know if there's some other combo or some like- That's what like, I said the add-ons for. Add-ons cost. But stuff and costumes. Those, that's Ash's entire menu. I want to supersize my long- Because everything else yes. is included, right? But stuff and costumes, extra. But the second worker- uh, with the with the African American sergeant who's too buku, she was free to negotiate, and she seemed to allow that all of those add ons were included. Yeah, but he had a fine specimen of Alabama plastic. He he did he did. And we're not talking about her. This is this is my this is my menu here. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. To, you, I used to watch that show, that show on <laughs> HBO about the legal brothel and cat house. Yeah, cat house. I mean, those girls have pretty good negotiation skills. Yeah, I think a la carte is the way to go. I just want to see Ash's like chatterbait menu. <laughs> Tip 500 tokens, you get a costume, 600 <laughs> butt stuff. That's it. Yeah. Spin the wheel. It's only Lance. <laughs> exactly. it, the, the, the wheel is just two halves, butt stuff. Co costumes. costumes are going to be below butt stuff for sure in price. But I don't know. My tagline would be my vagina is that. <laughs> I want to level up, Gene. I want to level up to the next package. You're you're right. So it's like a punch card. Besides all the negotiation that we get to see with the the workers of Vietnam, the movie takes a distinct tonal change, I think, in the way that it's shot. The first half we get the boot camp. It's very stationary. We're in the platoon. We're we're there. Here it kind of shifts where that you mentioned the exposition, the voiceover gene. They break the fourth wall. All of a sudden we're part of now joker we're going out we're part of these interviews where they're doing of soldiers it's almost like they're interviewing us we're seeing the cameras and behind the scenes and we're walking with them on patrol and when they're attacked the style becomes very rough very handheld very first person shooter video game call of duty we're embedded we're in the fight we're now there and it's just such a such a change and i think it embedded us within the chaotic nature of combat that Full Metal Jacket captures that moment that a lot of Hollywood films don't. I agree, because it doesn't just put us in there like as the soldiers where we see what they see. More importantly, as like the movie progresses, we can't see what they can't see. And that builds tension on its own because it's really disconcerting. It's really disorienting. And I think it it works great that that shaky cam and the cinematographer on this had uh, an idea to put the camera like off kilter. Mm. And that's why it's it gives you such like a weird yeah. point of view where it feels like something's just kind of quite off. And it feels like you're looking through somebody's eyes that aren't your own, but you're still looking through somebody's eyes. And it's very being John Malkovich, but in a much more war type way. Saving Private Ryan came out a, a decade after this, and it clearly borrowed a lot from that way sequence. And it's a wonderful mix of styles. Like you mentioned, Big D, it's it's handheld. Uh, you've got some beautiful cinematic, like wide shots. My personal favorite is when that camera crew is moving across the line of Marines who are taking cover, and it's just playing surfing bird at like full blast. And if you watch the things that go by that camera, there's like a guy on a stretcher, and then there's like some weird bandaged guy. He looks like the Invisible Man, like he's waving. And then finally, as it scrolls by, you know, the first tank, and then it goes by the second tank, and that tank just boom, just fires off. It's one of my favorite moments in film. And again, Ash, like you mentioned, this is a serious dramatic film it is tense but you're smiling at the same time it's so hard to explain when i was younger i thought like you said big d first half of the movie fun second half kind of a downer now i think the first two thirds are very genuine it's it's good filmmaking it feels like real people doing real things the final third it's a little preachy 
Like when Cowboys unit, the Lust Hog squad, while they're standing over Mr. Touchdowns and hand jobs bodies and they're they're looking down and the camera is like panning from each, they each have to say something perfectly fitting their characters. And the camera's just so self-satisfied. And thankfully we had Animal Mother, uh, played by Adam Baldwin from Firefly, to keep things moving because it just felt like they were going a little too hard. But Gene, what's a Vietnam movie without a message? True. We gotta give you the message. It's less preachy than some others. I mean, don't we remember that Coppola said after making Apocalypse Now, this is not a movie about Vietnam. This is a movie of what Vietnam was. You know, I mean, I think that Vietnam movies get very heady with their, not just their messages, but with these overt tones of like, war is bad and war is hard. And it's like they have the the entire, you know, market there because World War II movies don't do that. World War I movies, as few of them as there are, don't do that. Even Desert Storm movies, like the atrocity that is a film like Black Hawk Down, they don't do that. There's something about Vietnam movies where they got to leave you with a, is the military good? You know, with one of those question marks at the end. And I agree with you. It gets a little preachy at the end, but maybe it could have just been a boot camp movie. That could have been fun. Well, assuming command, squad machine gunner Animal Mother leads an attack on the sniper. Joker locates her first, but his M16 rifle jams, alerting the sniper to his presence. As the sniper opens fire, she is revealed to be a teenage girl. Rafter Man shoots her, wounding her mortally. The squad discusses what to do while standing over her as she lies wounded. She painfully says, shoot me, and Joker does. Later, as night falls, the Marines return to camp singing the Mickey Mouse March. A narration of Joker's thoughts overlays the singing, saying that despite being in a world of shit, he is glad to be alive and no longer afraid. So Big D... I've clearly never been in combat, and I mean no disrespect to any Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, or merchant Marines, but I have to ask how good these Marines are, because they move super slowly, like unbearably slowly through combat zones, and I understand you don't want to trigger any booby traps or mines, but maybe if you're going to move that slowly, don't do it out in the open. And next, you got guys like Crazy Earl who's just like picking up toys in the rubble. And you got guys running into sniper's kill zones despite being told not to. I can't tell if the movie wants us to believe that they want to die or that they're just like tired of being vigilant. Like maybe that fatigue just sets on you where you're like, you can't be on guard all the time. Or is it just like bad filmmaking and and a lack of understanding about combat? One of the things that disappointed me the most when I got into the military was realizing that not everybody was proficient. I thought, hey, everyone's going to be skilled. Everyone's going to know their job. Everyone's going to have the best intention to be their best at all time. People are stupid. You know, you you look, most of the piles of the world would have gotten through. And those dudes aren't thinking. They're not on the same level. So it's it, it's tough, you know, and I'm not saying that everybody's dumb, but you have your share of those guys who are going to pick up something that's obviously a trap. And even the best trained, the people who are, are, are proficient at what they're doing, When you're up for days on end and your brain is going through a constant level of stress, all the training wears off. A a stupid toy is just a stupid toy. You might pick it up because it reminds you of something. And, And I think even with the best training, it'll eventually wear off in time. I think the other thing is that you just get desensitized to this idea of dying. And my dad talked about that. He said that eventually, like he was terrified the first time, the first few times he was in active combat, he said he was absolutely terrified. And then eventually he got to the point where he was just like, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And so he would run in, he would run at them rather than like waiting because he said he'd rather like be active in his own death than be passive and receiving it. And so it could be some of that too. Everything's been realistic. Everything's felt grounded. And then we get the shocking death, you know, where Cowboy gets killed. And and instead of making this an impactful, emotional, real world death, it becomes, oh, no, (laughs) Oh, oh, slow motion falling to the ground. I couldn't believe this was Kubrick, that, that, that he would choose to do this. That was so Hollywood and so forced and fake. I noticed the same thing, and you know I hate slow motion in movies, but I think this slow motion was for a reason. I took note of like who died slow and who didn't. And if you note, the guys who were best adapted to Vietnam, they died quickly and cleanly. Like Mr. Touchdown, he's just casually talking about his football days. You wouldn't even think he's in a war zone. He's walking along behind the tank. 
boom, boom. He takes shrapnel and he's just done. Crazy Earl, he says he belongs to Vietnam. He's the guy that's like, ah, it's a birthday party for my friend, Charlie. <laughs> These are the best people you ever meet in life. When we go back to the world, there won't be anyone worth shooting. You know, He triggers a booby trap, boom, he's just gone. But meanwhile, guys that had empathy for people, guys who had humor, guys who were kind and warm, cowboy, eight ball, doc, those guys who retained their humanity and seemed like not people made for war, but rather Americans who just happened to be stuck in Vietnam, those are the guys that died slowly and painfully and graphically. I think there's something there. I think that you're spot on. I mean, I think it makes us experience their death in a way to show that while deaths happen quick, like the consequences of them are long lasting, right? And I think more so than that, if anything, I was just pleased that we didn't have another tap situation where like somebody gets shot, and nobody tries to save them, and they just like cart them off in a slow motion ambulance. So it's an improvement. We did get Doc going like, yeah, he's dead. And dude's like still clearly alive. He's like, yeah, he's, he's, he's dying. <laughs> true, true. But I wonder about this every time I watch a war movie. Are the guys who are struggling with moral issues, like whether or not to shoot a sniper who just took out, I don't know, three of their friends, like are they too kind? Are they realistically conflicted? Because we had this debate with Roger during Save It Private Ryan. If someone shot the two of you, even if it's a teenage girl who looks frightened and wounded, I would physically, I wouldn't shoot her. I would physically stomp her fucking yeah. head in and probably hang her entrails from the windows like beaded curtains. I'd be so angry. That's so specific. My God. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> this is like the classic like death penalty debate. I think the people who are against the death penalty, you know, Big D, you and I have talked about it before. Like if God forbid somebody hurt Emma, you would want to kill them, right? God forbid somebody hurt my kids. I'd be like real pissed and I want them to be in jail, but I wouldn't want them to die. And so conflicted, I think, is a good word there because like, I mean, Gene before recording called me a dove mm -hmm. and if you're not familiar with that, it's a whole dove hawk thing, right? And I mean, I guess you're very hawkish, the two of you. And I, I don't even like a dove. I mean, doves are stupid birds. I don't, I don't, I don't like the bird. But I'm like a, a pacifist, right? Like I just don't want anybody to get hurt. We've talked about the brain is not capable of processing these things. As animals, we have a fight or flight response. You're not trained to have a fight, 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 fight response. Your brain shuts mm. off. You're in the heat of battle. You're trying to survive. You're not going to immediately flip the switch and be like, everyone, could we sit down and have a debate? Can we do a pros and cons list about whether or not it's morally right for us to kill this woman? Fuck no. Remove the threat. You want her going back and getting patched up and you got to take her out again? Eliminate the threat. And I'm not saying that there aren't people who exist who would be conflicted in this scenario. What I am saying is I feel like every movie, you get the guy who's like, oh, God, yes. I don't know what to do. And it just doesn't seem consistent with Joker's character. No. Like she almost killed you. She shot at you to the point where you dropped your rifle. I'd be fine. There, there wouldn't even be a conversation. That bullet would be in her fucking head. Exactly. I can't believe I can't believe Animal Mother waited around that long. <laughs> Which is why in a war zone, you both will survive and I will be murdered very quickly in our war movie. But in the original ending of this movie, actually, you know, talking about the people living, dying, Joker was supposed to die in the original script. Kubrick had intended for his character to go. But Matthew Modine, he convinced Kubrick to let his character live. And the two of them had this big debate. And what they settled on was that it was crueler for Joker to live and survive this because living with what he's seen, living with what he's done as a consequence of being made into this killer was so much worse than like the dying and being at peace because now he won't find peace until he's dead himself. I think that's betrayed by that dog shit final soliloquy, though. I kind of wish Joker had died. Yeah, it's pretty bad. My thoughts drift back to erect <laughs> nipple wet dreams about Mary Jane Rottencrotch and the great homecoming fuck fantasy. I am so happy that I am alive in one piece and short i'm in a world of shit yes but i'm alive and i am not a friend like no just let us quietly watch the marines sing the mickey mouse club song while everything is burning at night it's yes. a much better ending the, the, again the narration hurts this movie totally agree yeah, I don't disagree. That's why it's not a perfect film, spoiler alert, um, is because Ooh. of little things like that, for sure. But I will say, I, I said at the beginning that I was hopeful that somebody would, you know, 
commission uh, Apocalypse Now because, as I said, these two movies kind of get labeled as the best of all time when it comes to war films. And while the latter, Apocalypse Now, I feel like has more memorable scenes, because of the script, I think that this movie leaves you feeling shaken in a way that only Stanley Kubrick can. Because here's the thing about Kubrick. Is he perfect? No. He is somebody that had a lot of trouble editing himself, which is why his movies are so fucking long. And he had a lot of trouble not putting in those little digs, right? Like he, he thought he was smarter than everybody else. And you can feel those moments in all of his films, including this one, for sure. That's a big critique that I have of him. But... When he's on, he's fucking on, y'all. And in The Shining, like The Shining is not a perfect horror film, but there are moments of that movie that are scarier than any other horror film that has ever existed. If you watch Eyes Wide Shut, there are moments of that movie that are scarier than any other psychological thriller that you have ever, ever seen. And in terms of Kubrick does war, in terms of this movie, there are scenes of this movie that are more disturbing and more brilliant than any other war movie you're ever going to see. So that's where I am on it. But I'd like the opportunity commission Apocalypse Now because maybe I'm wrong. Martin Sheen's hot in that movie. Could be fun to watch. Apocalypse Now, I feel, is a bit more thinky. Like with its heart of darkness symbolism, the literary aspirations, Full Metal Jacket, like I talked about being a nine-year-old watching it, it's accessible to everyone. Whether you see it as an entertaining war movie or comedic movie, a psychological sketch, political commentary, I think it is the better movie of the two if I had to choose. I just appreciate that you use the word thinky and a Joseph Conrad reference all in the same sentence. This is why I love you, Gene Lyons. <laughs> Thanks. Well, now is the time in our podcast where we give our wipe scores for Full Metal Jacket. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It's a low angle shot of Anne Margaret, complete with fur and early morning dew. <laughs> and Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It is banging all of Lust Hog Squad for $5 a pop, starting with Animal Mother. Big D, speaking <laughs> of Animal Mother, we'll start with you. So, I mean, this is one of those instances where you start off with an idea of where you're going to score it, and then the conversation kind of sways you. I had originally said it was going to be a 1.25 wipe, but I think that's ridiculous now. <laughs> going back, uh, I'm going to use my my Red Dawn measuring stick. Red Dawn's a one-wipe movie. It's impossible that this film could be worse than that. So I think I have to give it a 0.75 wipe. It, it, is, it is not perfect. But it is something special. The first 45 minutes are some of the most realistic basic training ever depicted in film. Second half for me, it loses a little bit of the steam. It's disjointed. It's trying to tell a lot of different stories. And there's no complete arc for the full two hours of the movie. But what it does well, it does exceptionally well. And its weakest parts are more slight flaws than they are holes in the movie. So I think 0.75 is fair. It's not perfect, but it is it is something that most people should see. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think I mean, I don't think it's any surprise based off of my review throughout that I think this movie's amazing. I love the script. I love a Kubrick war film and I love the acting. We didn't talk a lot about Matthew Modine, but Matthew Modine is so freaking good in this yes. movie. He's fantastic and your supporting characters are all really good in this movie. This movie, I think, is almost perfect. It's a little long in the tooth, as most Kubrick films are. It gets a little disjointed. I completely agree with Eugene that the narration takes some things away. It takes you out of the film. And the ending monologue alone makes it not a perfect film because it should have been edited. But... It has a cynicism to it, a dark humor to it that I feel is long lasting and super effective. And the greatest compliment I can give it is that while it is a Vietnam film, it doesn't feel like a Vietnam film. It feels like a war film and the way that other Vietnam films feel like solely only Vietnam movies. Like I feel like the soldiers in this could have been fighting any war. They could have been fighting anything because they don't get into the politics of it. They don't talk about the draft a lot. They don't get down into the nitty gritty about them going going home as quote unquote baby killers and all that awful stuff that they experienced. Instead, it's just this is what being in the military can be like. And this is what it takes in order to be successful at it. And I love that about it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's almost perfect. For me, it's a half a wipe. I will match that half wipe, Ash, and echo pretty much everything you said. Like much of Kubrick's work, Full Metal Jacket, when it's good, like you said, better than anything I've ever seen. 
Yeah. Like I would literally pay the full price of admission for a movie in today's money just to see the barrack scenes or just to see the combat in way. It's as good as other movies take two hours to be. But Kubrick also, like you said, has a tendency to get self-indulgent late mm -hmm. in his films. And we saw that with AI. We saw it with The Clockwork Orange. We saw it with The Shining and so many others. It is not perfect, but it is really, really close. So again, half white for me. And with a half wipe from me, half wipe from Ash, and 0.75 wipes from Big D, that gives us an average wipe score of 0 0.583 repeating for Full Metal Jacket. So, Gene, with a score of 0 0.583 repeating wipes, that now ties this movie in the 38 spot with Beetlejuice, E.T., Clueless, The Hunt for Red October, and The Monster Squad. That's such a weird group of movie. I know. I was okay until you said end. The Monster the Squad, Monster although it's a great good. film. But the Monster Squad's good. It's just weird. I would have liked to have seen Montana. <laughs> like, in hindsight now, I feel like Hunt for October is so fucking cheesy. Yeah, to I, know. I was about to say, now I don't know if we don't need to go back. I don't think that's... Oh, I think I found an error. Okay. <gasps> yeah, go on. The Monster Squad cannot be 0.38 because it was one wipe, one wipe, and 0.5 wipes. So that's Yeah, 2. no, that's 5. not the same maths. It must be 0.83. Yeah, that's what this is. Oh, oh. This is 0.5. This is oh, 5, 8, God. Okay, my mistake. Sorry about that. Shoo. Woo. If only we had a really overdone spreadsheet with lots of complicated <laughs> math to figure these things out. Okay. So, Gene, with a score of 0 0.583 repeating wipes, that now chies this in the 24 spot with Boogie Nights, Happy Gilmore, and Goodfellas. Uh, much better. Yeah, that feels right. That yes. feels right. Yeah. Although Happy Gilmore is a weird addition in there with those films, but Happy Gilmore is great. But no, this, this I think it makes total sense. All right. Well, Steve, you picked another good one. 0 0.583 repeating wipes for Full Metal Jacket. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Gene, next week, set up by their boss to be knocked off following their final heist. Soon to be retired crooks, Brian and Charlie, get wind of their impending demise and run off with the spoils of their crime. Commissioned by Kevin B. Came out in March of 1990. And this was one of the hardest films we've had to find. Is that Kevin Brackett? No, I don't think so. That would be such a troll. It'd be such an amazing troll. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe it is. He did this on purpose. That son of a bitch, no. We're going to make Kevin record this one Fuck with us. Fuck you, Kevin. <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin, for your commission. Thank you, Steve, for your commissions. And thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatpod.com, where you can also leave us a voicemail using the speak pipe feature. Also check out our sister podcast, Shot on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV. Wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Ash and Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next time for the following movie. Brian and Charlie were a couple of average, hard-working gangsters. Hit the dick when you're dead! Yeah! You shot Louie, you twerp! Who'd had enough. I really hate this bank job. No insurance? No job security. You want to work for somebody else? No. No. Now, what we ought to do is steal the money for ourselves. Brian, they're gonna kill you! Let go of me! You're trying to commit a major crime! Now... Hold it! Are you off your trolley? Throw them bags over here. They'll need more than divine inspiration. We're out of gas! You stupid dummy! <laughs> They'll need a miracle. What is this place? We'll never get to the airport. The place will be crawling with cops. What are we gonna do? And what is your name? Sister and Violata of the Immaculate Conception. And yours? Sister Euphemia of the Five Wounds. Five Wounds, for short. They're nuns undercover. I don't look. Do you not usually wear makeup? It's our day off. Nuns in luck. <laughs>
We run a teacher training college for 18 to 22 year old girls. You have experience? Of 18 year old girls, yes, plenty. <laughs> Nuns in hot water. We all share bathrooms and showers, of course. We, we don't tolerate nudity in any shape or form, especially our shape. Nuns out of bounds. <laughs> Love exercise. <laughs> and nuns off their rockers. Got any booze? But most of all, I want Brian and Charlie. Fade! They're nuns on the run. From now on, it's every nun for himself. <laughs> Eric Idle. You'll never get away with this. Robbie Coltrane. This is our only chance to go straight. You call this going straight? Nuns on the Run. The story of an immaculate deception. Oh!